subscribe direct from Bakersfield with Les Brown and his band of renown. Our singing star, Margaret Whiting. Our special guest, Ida Lupino. And here he is, Bob Hope. Thank you very much. Tonight we're doing our show from Bakersfield, California, where everyone gets a fair shake. <laughs> yes, sir, Bakersfield, California. I think it's in California. You never know when this town moves. <laughs> and of course, the Quakes have made some things a little easier. Nobody ever shakes a mall of milk up here. Just put ice cream and syrup in a glass, put it on the counter, and the drugstore takes it from there. <laughs> they had to close the Arthur Murray studio because no one needed lessons. Around here, you're born doing the samba. <laughs> I went up to a man on the street today and said, can you point out the earthquake damage? He said, I'm visiting here myself. I thought you were some of it. One of my pictures was playing here at the time, and the theater was really shaken up. After the quake, the marquee read, Bob Hope and Marlon Bingo and a pale face named Son of a Streetcar. <laughs> and Bakersfield and Kern County have some of the richest farmers in the country, too. I talked to one farm today who was leaving on a vacation. I asked him where he was going. He said, I'm going to Texas to see how the poor folks are doing. <laughs> really rich up here. This is the only place in the world where the tractors have Cadillac fins. <laughs> oh, and this land is rich. In fact, up here, when a man strikes oil on his farm, the neighbors don't congratulate him. They just say, tough luck, old man. Those three square inches of ground would have made you a fortune planted in cotton. <laughs> Weather is novel here, too, isn't it? I won't say how hot it gets in the summer here, but after July 1st, the day is divided into three parts. Siesta, siesta, and poor Aunt Mabel, how are we going to scrape her off the patio? <laughs> and they tell me it's not easy enforcing the law here in the summer. After a few days of this climate, when you die, you don't care which direction you go. <laughs> Just so long as you go. I tell you, it's a great privilege to be doing our show for the Boy Scouts up here. You know, I used to be a scout. I'll never forget the day I became a Cub Scout. I was so proud, I asked my wife to throw a big party. <laughs> no, truthfully, I, <laughs> I was in the Scouts at the age of 10. Gee, you, would you believe 15 years has gone by since then? <laughs> would you believe 20 years has gone by? <laughs> 25? You're not an audience. You're an investigating committee. <laughs> the first thing I learned was how to rub two sticks together and make a fire. Then I rubbed four sticks together and made two fires. And in no time at all, my family was living in a tent next to the place where our house used to be. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Hope spent this week at home completing his memoirs. Now, when it's finished, Bob's life story will be the literary triumph of the year. It says here. <laughs> now, now, let's look in and see how the work is progressing. Now, where was I, Maggie? Well, you were at the point where you had your first taste of success in Hollywood. Oh, yes. At this stage of my career, I was the most eligible bachelor in Hollywood. During my bachelor days, I was very popular. You were? Maggie, so many glamour girls threw themselves at my feet, my argyles were soaked with taboo. <laughs> Why, Robert, I had no idea. Well, maybe you didn't, but I had plenty. Now, shall we go right on? <laughs> shall we go right on? 
Donna, would you like to take a few minutes off for lunch? Well, I certainly would, and I'd also like to point out, Bob, that I'm not supposed to be doing this work. What do you mean? Well, I'm not a secretary or a typist. My contract says Margaret Whiting Singer, and that's all it says. Well, you haven't read it under an ultraviolet lamp, have you? <laughs> well, I guess I really shouldn't complain. After all, how many girls get a chance to work with someone who's achieved the highest honor in Hollywood? <clears throat> an Academy Award. <laughs> Gee, Margaret, that's very nice, but I won that award several weeks ago. What makes you keep mentioning it? You do. <laughs> All right. You do read all the small type, don't you now? <laughs> now, look, Maggie, when we start Chapter 8, remind me to get, get the... Uh... Oh, hi, Bob. Hi, Mag. How's it going? Oh, hi, Bill. Hey, it's going fine, Bill. The memoirs are just about finished. I'm glad to hear it. All I need now is a title. That's a clue. <laughs> Bill, if you're going to keep grinning that way, would you mind switching your teeth to dim? <laughs> Bob, I thought you were going to try and sell your memoirs to a picture company. Have you not, had any luck yet? Not, not yet, Bill. There's so much red tape at the big studios. Well, I know a picture company where one executive producer runs the whole works, and they're always looking for good stories. Who's that, Bill? Well, the name of the company is The Filmmakers. Now, why don't you go over there and have a talk with the boss? Oh, well, I'll do that right away. I'll get the manuscript together, and I'll take along my family album so they can see pictures of me at various stages of my life. Oh, say, that's a good idea, Rob. What's this first picture here? Oh, that's my favorite, Bill. It's a snapshot of me as a baby lying in a bearskin rug. Oh, that, that's very cute. What do you call it? Sunny side up. <laughs> very appropriate. Say, miss, I've been waiting a couple of hours to see your boss. I haven't got all day. I'm sorry, Mr. Hope, but we're rather busy here at Filmmakers right now. I'll check and see if you can go in. Oh, thanks, honey. Oh, Miss Lupino... Uh, what is it, Mary? Bob Hope is waiting to see you. Bob Hope? You've been so busy, I didn't announce him before. Are you sure it's Bob Hope? Oh, yes, I'm very sure. Uh, what makes you say that? Well, I, uh, uh... Well, he was sitting on my lap. <laughs> That's Bob, all right. <laughs> oh, do you know him, too? Yes, I certainly do. And if he offers to take you to lunch, Mary, don't go. Why not? Bob's very shifty in a restaurant. When the check comes, he hides. <laughs> Why, the idea. Why, I'd go right after him and bring him back. Where he hides, we can't follow. <laughs> Shall I tell him you're too busy to see him, Miss Lupino? No, send him in. You can come in now, Mr. Hope. Well, it's about time. I... Well, hi, Ida. Nice to see you. Hello, Bob. Gee, it's been so long, I can't remember when I last saw you. It was that day we had lunch together at the Brown Derby. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, I meant to call you and explain about that. You see, the door jammed, and I have to climb out the back window. <laughs> Gee, Ida... I wish I had more time to talk to you, but I'm here on very important business. I have an appointment with the executive producer. Well, keep on talking, Bob. I'm the executive producer. You? Yes. I'm the head of Filmmaker Studio. What's the matter? You seem surprised. Well, yes, I am. I, I came here to see the fellow in charge of... Well, what I mean is I never expected the man who owns this company to be a woman. <laughs> well, I don't know what you expected, Bob, but I am a woman, and let's leave it that way. <laughs> You're a woman, but let's not leave it. Now, what's on your mind, Bob? Oh, I have a very interesting book here, Ida, and I'm sure you can make a great picture out of it. Now, the title of the book is... No, 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 wait a minute, Bob. <laughs> if this book of yours is an autobiography or a book about yourself or your memoirs, I am definitely and finally not interested. You see, I have tons of that trash offered to me every year, and I have absolutely no use for any of it under any circumstances whatsoever. Now, what's the title of your book? It's called Inside Gabby Hayes. <laughs> Inside Gabby Hayes. Yes, it's the true life story of one man's fight against his beard. Well, I'm 
sure I'm not interested in your life story. Don't turn down a gold mine, Ida. This book has some really touching stories in it. Here's one. This tells how I was walking along the street in Cleveland one freezing cold winter night, and a poor old man came up to me and offered to sell me his overcoat for 50 cents. You know, I gave the poor fellow that 50 cents, and I've been happy about it ever since. You should be, Bob. It's a very nice-looking overcoat. <laughs> Well, it could fit a little better on the shoulders, but I'm not one to complain. Now, look, Ida, I know you so well, I'm going to let you have this book at a real bargain. You can buy the whole thing from me for $5,000. Bob, I've told you three times I don't want your book. It's just a hopeless mess of stupid, inane, moronic drivel. Well, how about $15, and I'll wash your car? <laughs> now, look, Bob, why don't you give up this idea of selling your memoirs? This writing business isn't your type of work. Well, I have to keep busy, and Paramount doesn't have a picture for me right now. Hmm. I could use you over here. You could? Do you make comedy? No, mostly drama and mystery pictures. But it might be a nice change for you doing some acting. Acting? <laughs> what do you think I got the Academy Award for? <laughs> that and where elephants go to die is one of the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Please. No, I'm sorry, Bob. I, I didn't mean it that way. It just came out without thinking, you well, know? Well, you better be careful. You know, Ida, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, person who speak cautiously is like man in long underwear. Can always back out. <laughs> Say, Bob. Yeah, Bill? Uh, how did you make out at Ida Lupino's office? Oh, fine, Bill. She wasn't interested in my memoirs. However, she wants me to make a picture for her. Gee, that sounds swell. Oh, I don't know, Bill. It would be so different for me. How do you mean different? Well, the pictures that Ida makes are anything but comedies. Well, then what are you worried about? You made a lot of pictures that were anything but comedies. <laughs> that was very funny. Yeah, I kind of liked it. I hope <laughs> I hope you're still laughing next season when you're working as a Vigoro spreader in the potato field. I'm sure that you could do a picture for Ida Lupino, Bob. I saw The Hitchhiker, and you'd be great in a story like that. Yes, I can practically see myself in a story like The Hitchhiker. Just imagine. It's a stormy night, and I'm alone trudging along a dark highway. Behind me, the police are searching the countryside. <laughs> Special bulletin, ladies and gentlemen. There had been a jailbreak at Greystone Prison. Citizens in this vicinity are warned to stay in their homes and keep doors and windows locked as several dangerous convicts have escaped. The state police warns motorists not to pick up hitchhikers. It is reported that... Thanks for the lift, lady. You're welcome, but maybe I shouldn't have picked you up. Why not? The radio says there was a prison break tonight. Well, you don't have to worry about me, babe. I'm a college boy. <laughs> I'm hitchhiking back to UCLA. You're a college student. Why do you have that gun sticking out of your pocket? I'm on the football team. <laughs> Some of them scrimmages is moiter. Hey, what are you slowing down for? I'm going to stop the car and let you out. Yeah, step on the gas, sister. If you want to keep breathing, keep... I should have known you were one of the convicts. I should have known that weak, mean-looking face. <laughs> Those crooked, jagged teeth. <laughs> and those deep, staring eyes. <laughs> If you'd been through what I've been through, your eyes would be staring, too. What's that? Twenty years in a cell, six feet long and four feet wide, with 200 Marilyn Monroe calendars on the wall. <laughs> Come to think of it, why did I escape? What did they put you in prison for? I killed a man, but it wasn't my fault. It was an accident. An accident? Yeah, he ran right in front of my machine gun. Poor guy. I poured so much lead into him, he died of fallen arches. 
Hey, when you get up here, take the road to the left, Highway 99. Where are we going? I'm headed for Los Angeles. Why Los Angeles? If I commit three more crimes, I'll be on Dragnet. <laughs> Look, there's a roadblock ahead. The police have a barrier across the highway. They will drive right through it. Yes, but I... You heard me. Step on it. Stop that car. Stay police. There. A little excitement ain't nothing to faint about. Only a yellow belly passes out cold like that. Yes, I know. Would you care for another sniff of the smelling salt? <laughs> no, I'm all right now. You know something? I'm sorry for you. You're just throwing your life away. You must have spent an awful lot of time in prison. I just done a 30-year stretch. Oh, how terrible. Nah, the first 20 years went by like that. And all of a sudden, it got rough. Why? The novelty wore off. <laughs> It wasn't easy being out of the world all that time. Did you have a girlfriend? Yeah. Did she write to you? Only the first 10 or 15 years. That's the way dames are, fickle. <laughs> Slow down. We're getting close to where we're going. Slow down? Pull over. Stop the car under those trees there. What's the idea of stopping here? The guy I broke out of stir with is waiting in those woods. I'll signal to him. Here he comes. Hey, is that you, McGloin? Yeah, it's me. Hey, who's the skirt? Well, right after the break, there was a heavy rumble, so I flagged this broad driving a heap. I give her a glom of the Roscoe, and she got the shakes and dummied up. She's down to the lamps to play, but if she squeaks, we'll slip her the shift. <laughs> All I asked you was, who's the skirt? This is an outrage. You men have to let me go. Who are you, anyway? Now, ah, take it easy, sister. If it means anything to you, my name is Eggs McGloin. Eggs McGloin? Yeah. I'm left over from Easter. <laughs> they call him Eggs because his brains are scrambled. I'm asking you for the last time. Now, let me go. You'll never get away. There are police on all the roads. Attention. Attention. What's that? This is Captain Jensen of the State Police. You are completely surrounded. There are police on all sides of you. Open, McGloin. Walk out one at a time with your hands over your head. Hey, it's the cops. What do we do now? Kid, it's like I always told you. Crime does not pay. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> okay, coppers. I'm coming out. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. <laughs> Okay, Hope, now it's your turn. We got the spotlight on you, so walk out with your hands over your head and don't make any false moves. Okay, I'm coming. Oh! Oh, oh, they got me. They shot you because you moved. Why did you bend over? Well, it was my own fault. What do you mean? They put the spotlight on me and I couldn't resist taking a bow. <laughs> I want to thank Ida Lapina for joining us here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, our show here in Bakersfield, California, is to boost a great idea started by the Junior Chamber of Commerce four years ago. The first handicapped Boy Scout troop in the United States was started here, its purpose being to give handicapped boys the same opportunities that any Boy Scout can enjoy. The idea has been a success, and other communities across the nation have followed the example set by Bakersfield citizens and started troops of their own. You know, the future of any nation is only as bright as its youth, ladies and gentlemen. Scout training is one of the things that has made American kids the envy of the world. There's no greater example of democracy in action than making it possible for handicapped boys to be better scouts and better citizens. Thank you very much. <laughs> facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>